Good morning, dear students. Today, I like to talk about acute bacterial meningitis, one of the very important topic in pediatrics as well as in internal medicine side. You'll benefit, you know, in every subjects from this topic. So please uh, pay attention. Whenever you go to hospital and work as a doctor, especially in the infectious disease hospital or in emergency department, a lot of cases of meningitis would be there. So you should know exactly what type of presentation they have, how do you approach and how do you confirm the diagnosis and then finally, how do you manage? So we are going to talk about this in today's class. At the same time, when we study about the lumbar puncture and CSF analysis, we are differentiating between viral meningitis and tubercular meningitis as well, okay? So, but in detail, we'll study that in CNS, uh, you know, or neurology uh, under internal medicine. Let's move on. Now, we all know acute bacterial meningitis means meningitis caused by pyogenic organism, pyogenic organism, okay? But before that, we should define what is meningitis. Meningitis is defined as inflammation of the arachnoid and pia matter. This arachnoid and pia matter are known as leptomeninges. Okay, leptomeninges. So, inflammation of leptomeninges is known as meningitis. Never forget this. Dura matter is not included under the definition, but dura may be involved later on because of complication. So, leptomeninges inflammation is known as meningitis. If that meningitis is caused by acute pyogenic organism uh, or pyogenic organism, I should say, or bacteria who are, which are post-forming, then I'll call it acute bacterial meningitis. Meningoencephalitis is another term which represents inflammation of both meninges and the cortex of the brain. She has meninges and cortex of the brain. Inflammation of the cortex of the brain or parenchyma of the brain is known as encephalitis. So meningitis and encephalitis together is known as meningoencephalitis. In many of the cases, uh, you know, uh, this happens. Probably in the beginning, it may start as meningitis, but later on, it may also involve the cortex of the brain. Usually viral organisms are commonly, you know, having this. Let's move on. Now, what are the etiology of acute bacterial meningitis in children? We are, we are talking pediatrics now. So what are the uh, causes in children? So we always divide according to the age in case of uh, pediatric discussion because pediatrics is a diverse you know, field where uh, different types of ages would be there like up to three months from birth up to three months three month to three year and then more than three years okay so from birth to three months we have e coli gbs and listeria monocytogens what is the full form of gbs in this case okay in this topic what is the full form of this gbs which organism is this Anybody? So group, group B streptococcus. Exactly. Yes. Okay. You are absolutely correct. Group B streptococci. Also known as, what is another name? Streptococcus agalactiae. Okay. Streptococcus agalactiae. Let me write that here. Streptococcus agalactiae. This is another name of GBS. And Listeria, these are the most common organism. Staphylococcus aureus may also be there sometimes. Three months to three years, Haemophilus influenza, Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococci, and Nigeria meningitis or meningococci. Now these come into the picture. And more than three years, again, similar type of organisms. Uh, streptopneumonia or pneumococci, if the child is not vaccinated, okay, then uh, even hemophilus 
and Staphylococcus aureus. And so many other organisms will come into the picture, but these are more common. So from the examination point of view, we love to ask in this neonatal age group or up to the age of three months. They're almost like neonates. So these are the common organisms. Very, very favorite question in every pediatric exam. And one more point, to cover this listeria monocytogens, you know, we need to choose a specific antibiotic. Other antibiotics may not work against it. One of that is ampicillin. So when you uh, look at the management of this infection, you see ampicillin routinely as one of the antibiotic. Now, let's move on and talk about what are the risk factors of acute bacterial meningitis. Risk factor means in which situation bacterial meningitis can occur commonly. One is altered immunity. Okay, altered immunity. See there. If the child is having immunocompromised situation, okay, or immunocompromised status, then there is high chance of uh, meningitis, like any other infection. So there are different examples of altered immunity, which is highlighted here. Splenic dysfunction and asplenia. Recently, we have talked about this. What is the role of spleen in the control of infection? Spleen usually filters out the capsulated organism from the blood. Remember that. And spleen also has a huge role in antibody synthesis. So if spleen is not functioning well, or if there is a functional asplenia or anatomical asplenia, which, which uh, is not developed at all, then there's a big problem in that child. Repeated infection can happen. Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy means anti-cancer drug, anti-cancer drug treatment. Those anti-cancer drugs are targeting against the rapidly dividing cells and bone marrow cells are rapidly dividing cells. So they are also destroyed or damaged. As a result of that, there would be pancytopenia, resulting in neutropenia. Okay, let me write that, neutropenia. And neutropenia is a definite risk factor for any type of infection like meningitis. HIV and AIDS is the another one, okay? What is AIDS? What do you mean by AIDS? Anybody? Sir, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, sir. It's basically syndrome, sir. Uh, 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 sir, is caused by HIV, sir. Good. Good. He's absolutely right. But I need to add a bit of more thing there. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Absolutely. Caused by HIV. HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. But AIDS means it's a terminal stage of HIV infection. HIV infection has different stages. Okay. So... Uh, this is a big topic in medical side, okay? But in, in pediatrics also, if I have some time left, you know, I will talk about pediatric HIV. Not now, well towards the end. Uh, so, so what happens in AIDS? There is severe immunosuppression because HIV virus specifically target CD4 type of lymphocyte. And CD4 lymphocytes are known as master cells of immunity. So if those master cells themselves are targeted and damaged, then the whole immune system will be affected or suppressed. See this, it's make, I'm making it very easy. That's why in terminal stage of HIV, which is known as AIDS, any type of infection can occur. Bacterial infection, viral infection, fungal infection, parasitic infection, anything. Apart from that, any type of malignancy can also develop in AIDS, especially lymphoma, different types of lymphoma. Similarly, malignancy like leukemia and lymphoma, okay, are increasingly having chances of meningitis because they can affect bone marrow again, resulting in pancytopenia. In fact, any other type of malignancy in stage four, they can damage bone marrow because of metastasis. So 
they can also result in pancytopenia and then uh, can lead to meningitis. Okay, malignancy uh, also leads to severe loss of appetite. It leads to malnutrition, and that again leads to immunosuppression and can result in any infection. See that so many causes are there. Congenital or acquired CSF leakage. Now this is another important one. Congenital means because of faulty development. There may be some sinuses present. There may be some gap between the base of the skull present. Okay. One of the important uh, example I like to highlight here is spina bifida. Okay, spina bifida, which is uh, written here actually, but these are a bit of uh, you know similar type of things. Spina bifida are of different types. First is called spina bifida occulta. Okay, occulta means hidden. Overlying skin is normal, but underlying uh, gap is present in the posterior part of the vertebra. Okay, so this is known as spina bifida occulta. Another one is, you know, the obvious type of uh, uh, spina bifida, which is also known as aporta. There are different types like meningocil, meningomyelocil, and mylocil, and they have a high chance of having uh, meningitis. Why? What is the reason why spina bifida is associated with meningitis? Anyone? Why? Anybody? Uh, said because spina bifida, like said, like said there is an in, you know, incomplete closure of this uh, uh, of the spine and the membrane, the spinal cord membrane, sir. sir and sir, which uh, said you do it, there can be a chance of uh, infection, sir. Basically, higher chance of infection. Okay. Now, uh, see there. So you are right. Uh, let me clarify a little bit more on that. The same meninges which are covering the brain are covering the spinal cord as well okay and in spina bifida they are exposed now they are exposed now think about all these different types meningomyelocil mylocil okay all those things are even meningocil uh, this, uh, these uh, meninges are exposed and they can be easily targeted by microorganisms the community acquired bacteria so there's a high chance of meningitis in this situation. An acquired CSF leak occurs in trauma or head injury. Okay. A, a child or an adult who is a bad type of head injury, they can fracture the base of the skull, okay, resulting in CSF leakage. Now, there are uh, different uh, you know, types of fracture, anterior cranial fossa fracture, middle cranial fossa fracture, and posterior cranial fossa fracture. So accordingly, different types of clinical features will be there, okay? We'll talk about that in head injury topic in, in surgery. But that CSF leakage has a high chance of, you know, causing meningitis because microorganisms can enter into the brain from there. So this is a very important history to take. And another one is lumbosacral dermal sinus. This is a sinus, okay, uh, uh, around the lumbosacral vertebra and meningomyelocil, a type of spina bifida. Now, after knowing those risk factors, what is the pathophysiology of bacterial meningitis? See here. Bacterial meningitis most commonly result from hematogenous dissemination or from contiguous foci or from local extension. So these are the three mechanisms. <clears throat> so the most important one is a hematogenous root. So you need to understand in the beginning, microorganisms or bacteria should be present in the blood. Means they should reach the blood. They should evade the clearing from the blood. And then only they can reach to the brain. So there are certain circumstances for that. One are the circumstances for bacteremia. Okay. And another one, there must be certain type of immunosuppression so that those microorganisms cannot be removed from the blood or filtered from the blood. Another one is a contiguous foci. Okay, Contiguous foci means some nearby infection is there 
and from the nearby infection, the bacteria can easily spread inside the brain. Or from local extension like sinus, menstrual cavity, and infected tooth, which are very nearby structure or local extension, isn't it? This is sinusitis. This is mastoiditis or otitis media. And this is the infected tooth. All of them can result in extension of the infection inside the brain. The endotoxin of bacterial cell wall induces the inflammatory reactions. And there is serious type of inflammatory reaction, which is damaging our brain as well as meninges. The subsequent inflammatory response is characterized by neutrophilic infiltration, increased vascular permeability, altered blood-brain barrier, and vascular thrombosis. Now, you have to understand all of these, then only you will understand what type of clinical feature appear in meningitis and what are the complications. Now, see here. Neutrophilic infiltration is a very common thing here because this is caused by pyogenic bacteria. So neutrophils are the first line of defense against them. So there will be neutrophilic infiltration. That results in post formation. Our immune system will kill these neutrophils or they die during the fight. You understand like that? So uh, they die during the fight. They, they die during the inflammatory reactions. So that will uh, lead to post formation. Okay, and this pus is collected in CSF or subarachnoid space. So when we do the lumbar puncture, when we get that CSF outside, the pus is uh, present there. Sometimes the whole CSF is turned into pus. Another is this is a infection, so there is increased vascular permeability, which results in edema. This cerebral edema is quite common in case of bacterial meningitis. There is altered blood-brain barrier. So uh, any type of you know, harmful substance can enter into the brain. Now, it is good and it is bad. It is like uh, positive in both sense. It is bad in the sense that the toxins which are present in the blood like, should not enter into the brain, but they are entering easily. Now, what is a good thing here? That good thing is regarding the treatment. Anybody can tell me? <clears throat> Alteration of blood-brain barrier in meningitis is good thing regarding the treatment. Why? Sir, uh, uh, when the uh, alter blood brain barrier occurs, sir, uh, when we give the antibiotic, so antibiotic will go into brain easily, sir. Excellent. Very good. That is the reason. Okay. Very impressive. So see that we gave different types of antibiotics and some of the antibiotics, if blood brain barrier is intact, will not enter into the brain, will not enter into the brain. They are okay, not effective. But in this situation, because of extensive inflammation, the blood brain barrier okay, is permitting everything to enter. So antibiotics can easily go inside them and can lead to, you know, eradication or killing of the bacteria. But still, we want to give higher dose of the antibiotic and for a longer duration. Remember, still the entrance of uh, antibiotics is not that optimum. It is, of course, better than before. There's no doubt, but still not optimum like other tissues. So two things we need to uh, be careful here. One, high dose, and second, longer duration which we talk uh, during our management part. And another one is a vascular thrombosis. Now, because of this extensive inflammation and infection which is occurring, the blood vessel which comes in contact to that area will occur, okay, inside them, there will be thrombosis. Now, this thrombus or thrombosis will lead to ischemia in those area which are supplied by that blood vessel, okay? So don't be surprised if a patient with meningitis comes with paralysis of some part of the body, okay, which is known as neurological deficit. Let's move on. Now, after knowing this, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about the most important part of this lecture, which is clinical presentation. I always say this is the most important part of the lecture because you are going to be doctor very soon. 
and you should exactly know how this child present to the hospital then only you can diagnose okay investigations are there there's no doubt but in the beginning you should know what type of history you should take what type of uh, physical examination you should do so these are the parts of clinical presentation now please be attentive the clinical presentations are variable and differs according to the infective micro according to age and according to the resistance factor as well as the length of time between the onset of illness and first evaluation by a physician so lots of factors determine what type of presentation the child is having so according to infective micro means how virulent is the microorganism staphylococcus aureus is highly virulent organism okay in comparison to the other pneumococci is highly virulent okay. in fact in fact if any acute uh, you know uh, meningitis is occurring by pyogenic organism they are usually virulent we, we cannot ignore them oh this this child is uh, infected by some other bacteria so the child is not going to be serious if nothing like that okay but if i compare between the bacteria and the viruses now viral meningitis is self limiting illness even without treatment i mean the specific treatment okay the viral uh, meningitis is going to be resolved but we have to treat the child by supportive and symptomatic treatment age matters a lot remember from birth to 3 month we have got different type of microorganisms like e coli gbs and listeria so accordingly we have to choose the antibiotic and the presentation is also different because those children they are neonate they have a special type of presentation and we are going to talk about that resistant factor of the patient plays a big role the patient is immunocompromised probably there is no fever okay the inflammatory reaction will be very poor in case of immunosuppression and then what is the length of time between the onset of illness and first evaluation by a physician it also matters a lot because the chances of complications are higher if the patient doesn't come in time to the hospital if the patient comes quickly probably we have a good enough amount of time uh, to evaluate and diagnose the case the more dramatic and fortunately less common presentation is sudden onset with rapid manifestation of shock purpura dic and loss of consciousness loc loss of consciousness frequently resulting in death within 24 hour can you tell me uh, it has got one particular term in clinical medicine what is that term if this type of presentation is there yes which organism is is causing the infection in in this type of presentation can you name that organism first anyone this is known as okay meningococcemia now let me write it here meningococcemia now which organism is causing meningococcemia which organism which organism is causing this problem yes what is the name of the bacteria bacteria the name is written so here it's nigeria meningitis or nigeria meningitis exactly nigeria meningitis or meningococci so no, the name itself is here now this nigeria meningitis or meningococci can lead to meningococcemia in some of the child now this meningococcemia is such a severe type of infection within 24 hour this bacteria proliferates rapidly it can lead to septicemia septic shock dic and can lead to death of the child if not treated in time just 24 hour remember that so within 24 hour you need to diagnose it and start the treatment quite early and these are the common presentation here shock this is septic shock purpura okay this is a, a feature of dic this purpura okay are the hemorrhagic type of you know rashes 
this DIC is also known as purpura fulminans. There is another term which is commonly mentioned in the textbook. Purpura fulminans. These are the important term from the examination point of view. Okay, that's why I'm highlighting here purpura fulminans. Now, so the job is diagnose quickly in time and then start the treatment. This is caused by meningococci. So meningococci are still treated by penicillin or uh, we can go for cephalosporin, the third generation cephalosporin these days uh, for the treatment. At the same time, you need to give a lot of IV fluids because the child is in shock and uh, many of the you know, pediatrician or the uh, physician, uh, they uh, want to use corticosteroid in this type of situation, corticosteroid, okay? Not in every case, but in this case, because of one specific reason, it can badly damage the adrenal gland and can cause one of the specific problem. Do you know what is the name of that problem in the adrenal gland, which is causing by meningococci? What is the name? The term is called Waterhouse-Fredrickson syndrome. Waterhouse, okay. Fredrickson syndrome. I'm sure you have heard this term before. Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is bilateral hemorrhagic infarction of the adrenal gland. This is caused by meningococcemia or the same organism known as Nigeria meningitis. So uh, whenever the source of the steroid is gone, we have to give steroid. So this is a very specific reason here. But in other cases of septic shock also, we can have a trial of corticosteroid. Let's move on. In general, what are the common features of meningitis? Let's talk like that. Let's talk the common things, okay? So most of the children present with fever. This is a bacterial meningitis, so there will be high-grade fever, high-grade. Loss of appetite, very non-specific feature. In any type of infection or disease, loss of appetite is common. Irritability or drowsiness or high pitch cry. These are important features. The child is highly irritable or sometimes if the involvement of the brain is a bit excessive, then there will be drowsiness also. And many of the small baby, they have a high pitch cry, which is known as shrill cry, okay? High pitch cry. And uh, this is uh, quite intolerable for the parents. So they are quite concerned why the child is crying like that. The child is inconsolable and crying with a high pitch. So because of this single clinical feature, you know, the, the parents may bring the child to the hospital along with other features, of course. Vomiting, it's quite common, vomiting, okay? Sometimes this vomiting is projectile vomiting because this vomiting is, is caused by raised ICP or raised intracranial pressure. So projectile vomiting and photophobia. So what is photophobia? Light or fear, sensitive fear, conditions. Fear of light. Light diffusion. Exactly, you are right. Yes. Fear from light. Exactly, fear from light. Okay, that is a literal meaning, he's right. It's the literal meaning. Okay, the practical meaning is when this uh, type of patient goes out to the sunlight, you know, they cannot see properly. They cannot open their eyes. They feel very uncomfortable in the sunshine. So that is known as photophobia. It is one of the important features of meningitis. Another is headache. Now, headache is quite common. This headache is caused by raised intracranial pressure again. By small babies, they cannot complain of headache. They just cry. But bigger child, they can definitely complain. And in adults, it is a very important feature. Now, another is neck rigidity or nuchal rigidity, important feature. This neck rigidity means the person cannot bend the neck, cannot flex the neck, you know, that is the meaning. And this neck rigidity occurs because of spasm of the muscles which are on the neck. And this spasm is present because of irritation of the nerve 
are the spinal root which are coming out from the spinal cord because that area is inflamed remember that the leptomeninges are inflamed and those leptomeninges cover a small part of the spinal nerves which are coming out as a result of that uh, there is spasm of the muscle which is supplying by them that is the cause of neck rigidity back pain similar type of explanation if neck muscles can be rigid then back muscles can also be rigid okay so that is the cause now some may present with seizure which may be focal or generalized seizure can be a important presentation in case of meningitis now what is seizure i'll take a class about seizure later on but let me ask you what is seizure anybody any student uh, so it is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain sir good good which results in so it results uh, in what? what what can you see in the child now so they be sir the certain um, said the rigid muscular spasms sir which which like that 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 rigid movement of the muscles sir exactly very nice yes that's the exact thing which is explained by the patient party now listen properly seizure okay occurs because of abnormal electrical activity inside the brain in any part of the brain in one part if the abnormal electrical activity starts it may diffuse everywhere okay it may transmit everywhere and if it transmits everywhere especially the diencephalon area and from there everywhere then we will have generalized type of seizure but if it is a localized to one area and not spread to other then we have focal type seizure okay now this seizure leads to either motor abnormality the motor abnormality means some spasm of the muscle or repetitive okay flexion and extension type of movement in the muscle so we use the different terms which are called tonic and clonic seizure tonic means contraction clonic means repeated flexion and extension type of movement this is a motor type of seizure okay sensory seizure can also be there then autonomic seizure can also be there so behavioral abnormality can also be there so seizure can be of different type so i will take a detailed class about seizure and during that time you'll understand it in a good way but remember seizure can be there in case of meningitis what are the other symptoms apart from this there is poor feeding in the child uh, there may be myalgia arthralgia tachycardia hypotension means fall in blood pressure petechiae purpura or erythematous maculopapular rashes these are uh, very common in purpura fulminans or meningococcemia which can result in meningitis or they may be present in some viral infection which may lead to viral meningitis okay so these are some other symptoms now sometimes uh, this meningitis can lead to complication complication there are so many different reasons for that one raise intracranial pressure can lead to complication another okay severe inflammation of these nerves which is caused by the nearby inflammation can also result in nerve damage and another one lack of blood supply because of thrombosis okay can also result in a uh, damage to the nerve so oculomotor nerve abducens nerve facial nerve and even auditory nerve can be damaged the oculomotor is which which nerve which cranial nerve according to the number sir three cranial number three sir and abducens cranial nerve sir very good abducens is six 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 exactly six so so why i am asking this question is this is a very very common question which is asked to the to the student during exam okay so remember if you do not know this it will give a very bad impression to the teacher so any type of cranial nerve uh, can be affected but these are uh, relatively more common facial nerve is seventh and auditory nerve is the eighth one 
this is a part of vestibulo cochlear nerve cochlear nerve is also known as auditory nerve so there may be hearing loss after meningitis there may be you know uh, for example the extra ocular muscles which are supplied by oculomotor nerve and abducens nerve can be damaged so damage to the extra ocular muscles can result in you know diplopia a double vision diplopia or double vision which can be quite prominent feature and oculomotor nerve has some other functions also like pupillary reaction so what is the function of oculomotor nerve regarding pupillary reaction yes anybody what oculomotor nerve is doing to the pupil okay that is oculomotor nerve is para parasympathetic nerve now you got the answer oculomotor nerve is parasympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve will always constrict the pupil constrict so constriction of the pupil is done by oculomotor nerve if oculomotor nerve is damaged pupil will be dilated never forget this so dilated and non reactive pupil one of the most common causes oculomotor nerve damage now which muscle is supplied by abducens nerve in the in the eye that is a you know extra ocular muscle which muscle i'm sure some of the student know the answer the lateral rictus muscle sir lateral rictus muscle exactly exactly lateral rectus muscle now, how i remember this see here so4 and lr6 so this is a very very common mnemonic which is taught to every medical student by the teacher all over the world this so is superior oblique by fourth cranial nerve that is trochlear nerve and lateral rectus by sixth cranial nerve that is abducens nerve okay so if abducens nerve is damaged the lateral rectus muscle is paralyzed so there will be diplopia the eyeball is is you know uh, eyeball is moving medially because medial rectus is still normal which is pulling the eyeball medially so that is the main problem facial nerve has so many functions the muscles of of facial expressions are damaged okay and auditory nerve can result in hearing loss so these are some of the important clinical presentation of bacterial meningitis now let me tell you again all of these features may not be present in a single child who is having meningitis it depends it is highly variable thing some of the features may be present uh, in that child and some features may be absent and in other child who is having meningitis some other features may be there now we're talking about uh, the different clinical manifestation in a case of bacterial meningitis now let's talk about if neonate have got bacterial meningitis how do they present now, see here there will be poor feeding the neonate was feeding quite well on the mother's breast is not feeding okay that well now lethargy okay sleeping most of the time irritability apnea okay apnea now what is apnea what do you mean by apnea absence of the sleep uh, sleep sir the cessation of breathing okay yes yes cessation or absence of uh, breathing for a short duration is known as apnea now uh, according to the definition that short duration is more than 20 second if a newborn do not breathe more than 20 second because of any reason we call it apnea and another uh, definition is also there okay, i'll i'll talk about apnea in detail in neonatology classes another one is even if the neonate doesn't breathe less than 20 second along with some other features like excessive pale okay excessive paleness or pallor decrease muscle tone or bradycardia then also it is known as apnea okay so meningitis or raised intracranial pressure is one of the cause of apnea probably because of you know uh, inhibition or damage of the respiratory shunter which is located inside the brain listlessness means 
the baby is not you know attentive or alert to the environment apathy okay is showing no interest similar type of things actually fever will be there but sometimes fever may be absent in a in a in neonate it depends hypothermia okay is a decreased body temperature hypothermia and hypothermia is considered even more serious than fever and remember in case of neonate hypothermia is very common in response to infection seizures would be there but these seizures are difficult to you know identify many of these seizures are called subtle seizures okay we need to clearly uh, observe them to find out the seizure activity jaundice this is persistence of the jaundice which is already there or appearance of new jaundice because of septicemia when liver is affected then new jaundice will also be there or the jaundice which is which is already there like physiological jaundice for example will be persisted for a longer time in the presence of infection bulging fontanelle another extremely important physical finding because fontanelle is open at that age and because of the raise icp as a result of meningitis there will be bulging of the fontanelle always examine this before the age of 18 month because 18 month is the age where fontanelle is closed anterior fontanelle okay pallor shock pallor and shock can occur quite commonly again as a result of infection a hypotonia shrill cry okay shrill cry is high pitch type of cry hypoglycemia because of excessive demand of the glucose as a result of increased basal metabolic rate okay hypoglycemia can occur very easily and if uh, these newborns also they do not have enough stores of the glucose or glycogen and then intractable metabolic acidosis intractable means difficult to treat now can you tell me what is the cause of metabolic acidosis as a result of meningitis in this case what may be the cause anyone due to apnea sir because there is a increase the uh, carbon dioxide in the uh, blood that's why sir due to the metabolic acidosis sir so, so it is hypercapnic type of metabolic acidosis sir mm -hmm. also ah. sir poor feeding also sir due to poor feeding there is uh, uh, which cause the uh, metabolic acidosis okay now now let's come to the point the metabolic acidosis okay and respiratory acidosis are two different thing respiratory acidosis occurs because of excessive collection of carbon dioxide yes respiratory acidosis may also occur as a result of apnea you are right it can occur okay i i i cannot deny that but more important is metabolic acidosis as a result of shock as a result of septicemia and shock whenever septic shock occurs which is very common in meningitis uh, there will be decreased peripheral perfusion as a result of that the aerobic type of respiration can it happen now the same mechanism will come into the picture every student know that collection of lactic acid okay which is one of the main uh, you know cause of metabolic acidosis here okay at the same time respiratory acidosis may also complicate the uh, baby let's move on now if we examine these children what are the physical examination finding that means examination finding in case of meningitis there will be painful neck flexion and rigidity of the neck okay. so this is known as neck rigidity or nuchal rigidity one of the very important clinical feature of meningitis but in case of pediatric age group if the baby is small then this test cannot be done because the neck is very short so we cannot do it in case of neonate this is impossible only in case of bigger child or in adult this test can be done another is positive kernig and brudzinski sign positive kernig and brudzinski sign now these are important you know signs of meningeal irritation now there are three signs of meningeal irritation which are which are written here neck rigidity kernig sign and brudzinski sign now let's talk about what is this kernig and brudzinski sign okay and then i'll come back to this slide now 
all of you please uh, see here this is the karmic sign you see this ask the child to lie down on the bed or if the child is very small one okay you do that put the child on the bed then okay raise the lower limb from the bed when you raise the lower limb you have to flex the hip so this is the hip joint here this is the flexion of the hip okay and then you have to uh, uh, flex the knee in the beginning the knee is flexed in the beginning now what we'll do we'll 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 catch uh, at the heel area and one of the hand is kept on the knee cap and then we we'll try to extend the leg now or extend the knee joint this is extension movement flexion movement is like this okay this is flexion of the knee there is extension of the knee when the knee is extended from the flexed position if this baby or if this patient is having meningitis then there will be tightening of the hamstring muscle the hamstring muscle will will be tightened and the the baby will cry with pain okay or even the back the lower back muscles will have severe pain okay so this is known as kernick sign positivity whereas the brzezinski sign okay after uh, the child is uh, lying like this okay comfortably just raise the head from the bed just like this okay but try to flex the neck if you do that see this both lower limbs will be drawn up from the bed or they will be flexed from the bed this is called brzezinski sign after flexing the neck both the lower limbs will be drawn up and flexed this is known as brzezinski neck sign or simply brzezinski sign so these are important one we should always try to do if we in a suspected case of meningitis now okay let's move further another important is bulging fontanelle and suture separation the bulging fontanelle if the baby is less than 18 month and similarly suture separation before the fusion of the suture another feature is called tachy cerebral okay the tachy cerebral means the red line that occurs in meningitis and other neurological disorder when a fingernail is drawn across the skin if we draw a fin fingernail across the skin for example in the anterior abdominal wall the red line will occur for a substantial period of time this is known as tachy cerebral and the mechanism why this occurs is poorly understood so this is a not that reliable type of sign nevertheless it is mentioned in different textbook so it may be asked in the exam that's why it is highlighted here now, reflexes if we examine okay they may be normal they may be diminished or they may be exaggerated it depends how badly the nerves are damaged if uh, they have uh, you know cause upper motor neuron lesions a damage of the upper motor neurons then the reflexes would be exaggerated if lower motor neurons are damaged then the reflexes would be diminished or even absent if the nerve damage is not that much they still may be normal okay so it depends what is there in the child i'm i'm sure you know what do you mean by upper motor neuron lesion what is upper motor neuron lesion let me ask this question now yes anyone anybody uh, sir like um... Like sir, they can be sir. Like sir, we can say sir, any damage to the motor neurons at that time, like like sir, above the nuclei of the cranial nerve, or like sir, the anterior horn cell, anterior horn cell uh, of spinal cord cell, those nuclei. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? I'll come to you. Okay. No problem. I'll come to you. Anybody else? Anybody wants to answer this question? What do you mean by upper motor neuron lesion? Or simply upper motor neuron first? Okay, now listen here, all of you. This is very, very important one. I, I, I think I have taught this uh, before to your batch. Upper motor neuron means okay, there are uh, two types of neuron. One is cortico, cortico nuclear fiber, 
okay cortico nuclear fibers another one cortico spinal fiber cortico spinal fibers now if you remember like this you never forget a cortico nuclear cortico means brain the cortex of the brain so from there the fiber starts at the nerve start and they will end okay they will end on the nuclei of cranial nerve nuclei of the cranial nerve this is known as cortico nuclear fiber but remember those nuclei are not part of upper motor neuron nuclei are always part of the lower motor neuron whereas cortico spinal fiber means it starts from the brain and end on the spinal cord where exactly on the spinal cord in the anterior horn cell but anterior horn cell is not a part of upper motor neuron they are part of lower motor one so then another question what is the lower motor neuron then from the cranial nerve nuclei till the periphery the whole the trunk of the nerve is lower motor one and from the anterior horn cell till the periphery that is called lower motor neuron for the spinal nerve never forget this absolutely important knowledge now there will be abnormal respiration abnormal respiration now remember in case of raised icp okay raised icp we have got three things occurring together which is known as cushing stride what are those three things what are uh, sir you got like sir uh, sir bradycardia sir and irregular uh, respiration sir uh, and uh, uh, like sir avoid and pulse pressure okay one is bradycardia good another is abnormal respiration okay yes, abnormal sir. respiration good that's why i have uh, brought this question here abnormal respiration also known as chain stokes breathing chain stokes breathing this is another term means there is a apnea and then you know hyperpnea together first this this child is having apnea and then there will be hyperpnea followed by the third one which is hypertension okay hypertension remember that so bradycardia means decrease in pulse uh, you know rate less than 60 hypertension for that particular age the blood pressure is on the higher side it is already high and abnormal respiration which is known as chain stokes breathing so this is a combination of very shallow type of breathing uh, followed by rapid breathing that is that's why it is known as irregular one so this is known as cushing stride it is a feature of raised icp and meningitis is one of the important cause of raised icp now see this okay so it is already uh, explained okay, but still if you want to revise here it is one of the physically demonstrable symptoms of meningitis is brudzinski sign so severe neck stiffness causes a patient's hip and knees to flex when the neck is flexed exactly like that you flex the neck okay the knees are drawn up and during this time the hip also drawn up so this is called flexion of the hip and flexion of the knee this is called kernick sign okay severe stiffness of the hamstring causes an inability to straighten the leg when the hip is flexed to 90 degree so there is spasm felt on the hamstring now let's move further what are some of the special features in case of bacterial meningitis for example if it is caused by nigeria meningitis what are the features there will be petechial hemorrhage on the skin and mucous membrane it is a part of meningococcemia there will be fulminant adrenal insufficiency which is known as waterhouse fredrickson syndrome okay waterhouse fredrickson syndrome the meaning is bilateral infarction of the adrenal gland now those adrenal gland will not work properly okay and it can lead to shock we need steroid hormone to maintain the blood pressure if that uh, doesn't happen then blood pressure will fall that's why in case of meningococcemia there is high chance of you know hypotension and early death of the patient if not treated in time in pneumococcal meningitis it usually follows otitis media 
sinusitis, pneumonia, or even head injury. So these are predisposing or certain risk factor for pneumococcal meningitis. There will be exudation and subdural effusion in, in this condition. Exudation okay, is leakage of protein-rich fluid, which can easily turn into pus. And subdural effusion is collection of free fluid in the subdural space. Subdural space. Sub means below, below the dura matter. Okay, and above the arachnoid matter, that space is having fluid. That is subdural effusion. Subdural effusion is difficult to you know, uh, suspect in the clinical examination, but it can cause prolonged fever and it can cause you know, the signs and symptoms to be persistent for a longer time. It can be easily diagnosed by CT scan or even by ultrasound. Now, another type of you know, uh, meningitis which is caused by bacteria is staphylococcal meningitis caused by Staph aureus. Staphylococcal. In neonate, it is associated with umbilical sepsis, pyoderma, or sepsis because of some other reason. Okay, this is septicemia. Umbilical sepsis is the infection of umbilicus. Pyoderma is infection of the skin, pus formation on the skin, and sepsis because of any other reason. In older child, it follows otitis media, mastoiditis, sinus thrombosis, pneumonia, arthritis, and septic lesion of the scalp or skin. Remember one thing, Staph aureus is one of the commonest organisms which infects our skin and subcutaneous tissue. Apart from that, it can also cause septic arthritis. Septic arthritis, very commonly caused by Staph aureus. It can also lead to staphylococcal pneumonia. Staphylococcal pneumonia. It can also cause otitis media and mastoiditis, though the chances are lesser than pneumococci and hemophilus influenza. But nevertheless, it can cause. And this sinus thrombosis okay, is dural venous sinus thrombosis, which can occur as a result of sepsis again. Now, in case of Hemophilus influenza and meningitis, seizure is quite common. Seizure may occur in other cases as well. Subdural effusion should always be suspected in infant with focal neurological sign and persistent fever. That what I just told you, because the signs and symptoms will remain. They don't disappear for a longer time. And one of the important point here is, there is residual auditory deficit, which is common complication. Hearing loss. Okay, will occur and will remain for a longer time even after the treatment is done in case of hemophilus influenza meningitis. And there is a, you know, some way we can prevent this auditory deficit. And that is by giving corticosteroid before we use antibiotic. First, you need to diagnose the case. Okay, after the confirmation of the diagnosis, give corticosteroid first and then only give antibiotic. If we do that, probably the auditory deficit can be prevented. 